Larry Novens, did we invite you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is Senate Government Operations. It is um, Wednesday, May 12th, and we are going to be looking at um, the proposal for a statewide code of ethics. And before we get started, um, I would like to uh, thank Senator Collimore for his report this morning on the eugenics resolution, uh, eugenics apology resolution. I think you did a really fine job. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate those words. Yeah, great. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so, Larry and Amarin is going to be with us off and on and off and on. She's jumping between three different places. Um, so, um, Tei can take uh, jumping jack lessons from Alex, from Senator Clarkson because she does them a lot, and you can just or leapfrog whichever. <coughs> so, yes, Senator Clarkson. I apologize for being a minute late. Joint rules ran late. Big subject, so I apologize. And uh, I just have to ask, Madam Chair, before we start, did we all uh, give? A big shout out to our own Senator Collimore for his great uh, presentation. Okay, great. We did. We did. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, where were we with this when we started going through it? I, it's been so long, and I really, really apologize. I am trying to remember the last time I had any notes on this. I don't remember. I'm I believe it was <laughs> April 7th or 8th. And we did a, a rough overview. I should say for the record, I'm Larry Novins, Executive Director of the Ethics Commission. TJ Jones is here with us, uh, professor at the University of Connecticut and ethics official formerly in uh, Connecticut and California. And he's consulted with us, or we've consulted with him um, a lot during the process of, of coming up with this. So um, I believe our last appearance before you was on the 7th or 8th of April. And there were a few questions. We did a rough overview of, a very rough overview of the statute. And then we submitted, uh, we were gonna come back, I think uh, it was the 9th, uh, we were going to come back a couple days later and we submitted a uh, tj drafted a uh, a four-page memorandum answering some of the questions that came up in the first meeting um, so you should all have that we gave that to you um, at the time and um I, I can briefly go over those things or i can give you an overview i don't want to get bogged down too much by the questions who were asked if, if going through it from scratch will we'll do it, make it easier. Um, so if, if I may, um, let me just outline what we did last fall again, and we gave your committee and the House Government Operations Committees uh, copies of our proposed code of ethics, um, along with annotated versions of what we had put out last mm -hmm. summer uh, for public comment. And the annotations contain not only the original uh, draft that we sent out for comment, but it also contained all the comments we received. So you could see those and see how we modified our proposal in a few places to accommodate the uh, uh, the responses we got. So I think it, the process should be very clear on that. Um, when we met last time in April, um, we did a rough overview, and I started out by highlighting one of the, the changes between what we submitted and what ended up being in language of H384, which is the Straft Code of Ethics. Uh, and that was the part that excluded um, the legislature, uh, the functions of the legislature, um, from the ethics code unless the code was adopted by rule in each house of uh, the General Assembly. And I can talk about that later. That was definitely not our suggestion. And in fact, it directly contradicts um, the section 
A immediately above it on page five, if you happen to be looking at it, uh, where it says that code would apply to all persons elected or appointed to serve as officers of the state, all persons elected or appointed to serve as members of the General Assembly, all state employees, all persons appointed to act on state boards and commissions, and persons who in any other way are authorized to act or speak on behalf of the state. And we refer to them all in the code as public servants. So, sorry, I, I, I've got, I'd, I'd love to know what document we're, are you wanting us to work off of H384 uh, in this conversation or your memo? And I don't see TJ's memo on our website. Um, Senator Clarkson? So, yeah. It is on the, the document, I believe that uh, Larry is referring to. I reposted on our website for today. Okay. Oh, I'm looking for today. And the two documents under Larry's name are both the November 11th, 2020. I believe. Yeah, they're 98, both. 98 page memo. Or yeah, memo it's sorry. the same memo. Yeah. Posted under two different titles. And, and so just curious, I'm happy to go to H384. I just... I, I just want to know what you want us to work off of. I'm, I'm happy to work off 384. I mean, that's the okay. one that has hit the public um, and went through legislative council. So and I'm that's happy to do that. That's technically still on the House website, right? It's listed as H384, and it's right. listed as having been referred to House Government Operations. Yep. Okay, fine. We'll find it. Okay. I did also just send that to Gail. So okay. she has it to post. I will post that. Oh, great. Okay, perfect. That's great. better. Okay. Can you email it to us? I'm sorry? Could you email it to us, Emran? I've got it, Emran. I'm doing it. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, so that was the one section that varied from what we had submitted. Um, in the, in the fall, but I can go through it because basically the substance of it is is almost identical in every other way. There's a word changed here or there, but nothing substantive. Um, what the what the bill does, and what our proposed ethics commission um, code of ethics does, is set forth some very basic and standard government ethics um, standards. And, and we start off with definitions of what a conflict of interest is. And then um, we go through a checklist of, of eight or nine, 10 different things that basically anybody in government should watch out for and avoid. Um, and the obvious one is to be aware of conflicts of interest. And, and more than anything else, when there's a conflict of interest um, in, and anything we do, the, the most important thing to do is to disclose, is A, be aware of it and disclose it. Um, and there are some conflicts that disclosure just takes care of it, you know, um, and there are others where disclosure might not be enough and we have to get into recusal. What we said in the code, um, and I can go through that in a little more detail, is whenever there is a conflict, um, if it's a real conflict of interest, you just recuse. Um, you don't participate in the matter. If you think that the conflict or the appearance of conflict is something that um, isn't important, doesn't matter, uh, is something you can still proceed on anyway, then what we suggested in our code is that the person um, just sign a little statement saying, I have seen this conflict of interest, I've reviewed it um, and find that it doesn't matter um, and that I can continue to work in this, that it's a minor matter, uh, it's not gonna affect me, um, and that there is good cause for me to uh, continue and work anyway, with notwithstanding what might be uh, the conflict of interest. And I'll get into that a little more. Larry? Larry yes. Can I, can I make a suggestion here? Certainly. Um, what I would suggest is that we take the bill and start going through it and ask questions as we're, as we go through it, then we can decide if there are questions or concerns, we can put a flag by them. And okay. if, if there aren't any, then we know that we're okay with it. Because if we, if we jump around, we're, uh, that's um, <clears throat> kind of a, a procedure that we 
have used in this committee a lot is to just go through and flag things where we have concerns and not flag things where we don't have concerns and get the questions answered. So that, if that makes sense. Oh, okay, sure. And, and to committee members, that is the way I would prefer that we do it so that we, um, okay, oh. I see a couple thumbs up. Yeah, that, that helps me. I, I opened the bill and just was already wondering, is this definition standard? Does it come from the federal government? Does, you know, so I was already, yeah, just looking at the language and wanting to. Okay. So there. let me start through and um, confidential and well, on page one of 14 of H384. Um, the, the only change on this particular page that our new ethics code provides is giving a definition for the term confidential information. And it just refers to the statutory uh, definition um, from 1 VSA 315. And basically, so unless it is confidential under that law or some other statute or law, then um, th that's the definition. So confidential information is a very small group, a very small uh, number of things in state government. On page two, the next um, section, is section four, conflict of interest, um, is what I believe is a very standard um, definition of conflict of interest. It mirrors to a great extent what is already in the governor's executive order 19-17. Um, the language also mirrors what is in the current code of ethics that the ethics code adopted. Um, and I can defer to Mr. Jones, but I think it basically refers to standard language uh, that appears in many other states' conflict of interest definitions. Okay. Yeah, Senator Calmer. Sorry, it's just a, I think a typo, but line two on page two, it says, or otherwise comma, of a public servant or such an interest. I think it might mean of such an interest. I'm trying to understand what that means. Oh, it's a, um, a an interest, direct or indirect, financial or otherwise, of a public servant or such an interest known to the public servant okay. of a member of his family. Okay. The way you read it, now I understand it. Thank you. Okay. It's the inflective reading that makes all the difference. Indeed. Yeah. Um, and then considering down, moving down, uh, we have a definition of gift. Can, can I go back to conflict of interest? Sure. There, the um, when we're looking at conflict of interest in our in the legislature, mm -hmm. there's very specific definitions in Masons, and it says that um, I'm trying to find it right now, um, but it clearly says that you we are uh, to be representing our constituents, and that. Um, unless there's an overwhelming, let me find it because I, I think it is less, I think that this definition would declare a conflict of interest in legislative um, world that is, um, be, goes beyond what Mason's um, says. And I'm trying to find it here. I think I can address that while you're looking for the definition in Masons, because okay. on, on line six of this bill, it has a relatively similar definition, Madam Chair. Yeah. On um, what? Line six of the definition of conflict of interest, I think mirrors what you're referencing. Yeah, but, but it, it even goes beyond that. In 522 in Masons, it says, the right of members to represent their constituents is of such major importance that members should be barred from voting on matters of direct personal interest only in clear cases and when the matter is particularly personal. And I think that goes beyond just that statement that um, um, <clears throat> and, and, and it also says, but the Uniform present practice is to permit all members to be the judge of their own personal interest. So th those are th those are the rules that we follow. Yeah. I have a couple of responses to that. Um, I don't think this definition changes what you do. And this is where jumping around, if we jumped around a little bit, when we get to page five, 
where it says the code of ethics doesn't apply to the functions of state legislature legislators that are protected by chapter one, article 14 of the constitution. This type of thing, what you do in committee votes you take are completely off limits to ethics oversight. Those are protected and they are reserved for you and you only. And no one Wait. can second guess those. And so your obligations or your duties to your constituents are in no way affected uh, by the definition of conflict of interest. Um, and, and in fact, a large majority, the legislative branch is different from the executive branch in that much of what you do is exactly that. It is dedicated toward your constituents um, and you are always asked to do things on their behalf and in their benefit. And what the constitutional protection does is it, it eliminates that from any scrutiny. So that, that those things are still protected and they are beyond anyone's question um, in the ethics code. Uh, uh, Madam Chair? Yeah. I have a problem with legislators being beyond a, an ethics code. I, I mean, I think that's, I, I, I think there are possibilities of, of real conflict of interest of representing your 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 uh, constituents. I mean, you could, there may be a huge amount of self-interest involved that is a conflict of interest that, I don't understand excluding, I guess I just don't understand excluding legislators. I think we are, we should be well, some I, code of ethics that is applied to the rest of the state. I, I, if I, I, may, I think, I think that, there are two things going on. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Two things going on. One is who the code should apply to. Every, and, and my position is should apply to everybody except those areas that are specifically ex excluded by the state constitution. So that would be your core functions as legislators that are protected by Article One, uh, Chapter One, Article 14, and judicial power being exercised under Chapter Two, Section Four. Those are beyond anyone else in state government's scrutiny. Um, and but th the code of ethics can still apply to legislators. And so if you're doing something in your town, if you're doing something, you know, um, on your own uh, to forward your own desires or something like that, that's one thing. But if you're in a committee and you're having a hearing and you're doing something in the hearing or you're voting on the floor of the House or the Senate, those are constitutionally protected activities. And no matter what we do or no matter what we want to do, they are protected. Um, um, from scrutiny by the outside. You are the sole judges of what is proper and improper when you're voting and not voting. And, and I think that that's been made, oh, Senator Paulina, I apologize, well, maybe, go ahead. No, that's okay. Just gonna need to confirm it. I mean, what we're saying is that voting, for example, is protected. But if I were, as a legislator, if I take a bribe from somebody, that's not protected. Correct. Right. That's different than voting. Yeah. It's it's your it's the so, core. So it still applies to me, function. except for when I'm voting. I mean, I, I know it's not just voting, but it, it, the, the rules apply to me, except those rules that directly relate to my core function, which is voting and considering legislation. Yes, that's right. But what if the bribe affects the core function, which is voting? You you take if you take a bribe, you violated the law. Not only yeah. the code of ethics, you violated the law. I, I agreed, but you people don't. It, 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 it may be happening and nobody else knows about it, or you owe somebody, I don't know. I I'm, I guess I'm having a hard time separating well, out. If uh, well, you were to take a bribe and vote consistent with the bribe, we wouldn't be able to, or anybody would be able to come after you and question the vote, but you would be subject to prosecution for the bribe. That is not within your purview. That is not constitutionally protected. Um, there so, is some federal I, law on this. There's no Vermont law on this, um, but the federal law makes it pretty clear that the purpose of the constitutional, uh, you know, the speech and debate clause in the federal constitution is to protect the integrity of the legislative process and ensuring independence of legislators. Um, but it doesn't cover things like bribes or other improper acts. If, if a legislator was to go to the governor 
um, and do something completely outside of making laws and say, you know, you better do this or we're going to come after you, threaten you, um, that probably would not be protected, um, nor should it be. Um, but again, two questions. One is, should the code, the general provisions apply to legislators? And yes, are there things that are excluded and those core legislative functions would be excluded? And this is where this, this is where going through it in order gets us out of line a little bit because uh, it appears in the order of the statute in a, in a manner that's consistent with statutory uh, drafting, but not really the, the theory uh, and how the uh, ethics code should work. But if I, if I could go back, um, I know it takes a while for this to sink in. I know drafting it, it took a long time for me to wrap my head around the differences between what is included and what isn't included. And I think if we talk for a few minutes about the types of activities that are included in the ethics code, it'll make understanding the exclusions a lot easier because the types of things that the code covers are very, very basic. And Madam Chair, with your permission, if I could just jump a little bit, maybe for two minutes and just go through the provisions, the things that we're asking legislators and executive branch and other people in state government to do. I think that will answer a lot of these questions. I, um, I will, except that I do want to point out that <clears throat> um, wh whatever decision we come to on page five, lines 11 and 12, only refers to article 14, or it's not article 14, it's actually section 14, because the articles are in, the, in chapter one. It, section 14, and section 14 only refers to the House. You ha it has to also add section 19 because section 19 refer says the same thing about the Senate. So regardless of what we decide. Right. And, it's and I didn't notice that in 384 before, and I'll have to double check and see if that's what we sent over or not. But. That's an excellent point. The, the point is that there are constitutional protections for members of the House and the Senate, and it, those it, should be part of this code. Um, but, okay. Uh, well, the <laughs> chapter one, article 14, it only is protection for the freedom of speech. That's all that, that, section refers that um, article refers to the is freedom of speech in the legislature it says it cannot be the foundation of any accusation or presentation that that's that's what that says but the in chapter two it clearly says that the senate and the house set their own rules and decide when and what not to expel a member and and um, uh, the election and qualifications make its own rules, appoint its own officers. Um, that so I, th I think we also need to refer to that. I think we need to be very clear that the House and the Senate by constitution set their own rules. And that includes conflict of interest rules. Well, so. I don't know if that excludes statutes, though. I mean, the, the fact that the Constitution gives you right to adopt rules doesn't mean that you are prohibited from adopting statutes that apply to everyone. Um, I am not so sure that um, I think we can, we can adopt the statutes but I believe we can't tell the House and the Senate that the statutes apply to them unless it, they are adopted specifically by the House and Senate ethics commissions. I, I think that is clear in the Constitution. I and I, I think that Betsy Ann has made that abundantly clear to us. Senator Clarkson. Once we adopt the statute, we could ask the House Ethics Commission and the Senate Ethics. I didn't even. I don't even know who serves on our Ethics Commission. Uh, the Senate Ethics Commission 
to adopt, to, to review them and hopefully adopt them. So, I mean, we can, we can encourage uh, our bodies, our two bodies to actually adopt these. Okay, let's go through the, the um, what it actually covers then. I just, because I, I really think that um, the way it's, the, the draft, you're right, the drafting um, constraints are, or construct, I guess it's called, is, makes it difficult to um, look at it. But what would be nice is to see what the code of ethics would look like. Right. But anyway, so go ahead, Larry. I'm sorry, but I, I, I feel very strongly that we need to make sure that the core functions of the two legislative bodies are kept sacrosanct. That's the right word. Right. And I agree with that. Um, so going through the, the do's and don'ts, right? This is what the, the guts of the ethics code, what we as public servants should and should not do. Um, we start basically with, uh, let me get here on page, Five. Yep. Um, and at the very bottom, starting on line 18, conflict of interest. What do we do when we have a conflict of interest? What do, what do we do in state government? Um, one of the things we discussed, um, TJ Jones and I discussed the other day, is there may be parts of this code um, that may not specifically apply to every area of government. And it may be appropriate if there is one particular provision that doesn't apply, say, to the Senate or the House, to say this provision doesn't apply to the Senate or the House. If, if we get there, we get there. But what we had suggested in this conflict of interest is that if a public servant has a conflict of interest, you acknowledge it. You say, I have a conflict. And if it's a conflict, you recuse. And that's the end of it. You don't do anything else. If you have a conflict, you, you note that I have a conflict of interest in this matter, and I'm not going to participate in it any further. Can I ask a question right there? Certainly. There is no ability for you to say, I have a conflict of interest. And for the other three board members that you are serving with, say, well, Really, I don't think that's a conflict of interest that rises to the level of, of um, I mean, if you, if, you, uh, if you feel you have a conflict of interest, you have to recuse yourself. That's what this says. No, you don't. You, you oh. recuse yourself if you have a conflict of interest. And if you feel you don't need to, um, you prepare a written statement disclosing what the conflict or the question may be and explain why there's good faith or why in uh, why there is good cause for you to continue participating in the matter. So okay. maybe something comes up and it doesn't look right. And you say, this looks like a conflict. I could recuse, but I don't think I have to. And here's why, um, because there is good cause. And this is where we jump around a little bit. Um, so if I can go through this, um, I'm trying to think where it says good cause. Um, it's on line three on page uh, six. Yeah, right. Why good cause as in section D, right. Um, and that is sufficient detail so that the matter may be understood by the public. So why there is good cause that I can still, notwithstanding whatever the issue is, I can still be uh, fair and objective and do this in the public interest. And if there's good cause and you can do that, you say, I have this conflict or I perceive a conflict, but I think I can proceed anyway. Um, can, and because it's not important um, that it is, I can be fair, objective and act in the public interest. So we can do that. Um, So is the reason for doing something in writing so that there's a public record? Is yes. that why? Yeah. 
So what I was thinking primarily in the executive branch, or it, you know, I suppose if it was a judicial branch person other than a judge, let's say I have a conflict of interest in something, something comes up. I, I say I have a conflict of interest. I recuse. That's the end of it. I don't need to do anything else. I've disclosed it on the record, the end of the game. But if I think there's good cause for me to continue, then I say, I, I take this little one paragraph piece of paper and I say, this is the issue. Here's why I can be fair. Um, and here's why it, um, it good cause exists for me to do it. And I just keep that piece of paper and it would be in my office or anybody else's office. It would uh, it, really, the more important thing is to get people thinking about the conflicts and to write them down. And in those closed cases where it's a should I or shouldn't I do it, it's just easier for most people just to recuse. But if, if there was a, an agency or department where somebody had a history of acting on matters where there was a conflict of interest, then we would be able to examine those, we meaning anybody in the state of Vermont, would be able to examine those to see what kinds of conflicts of interest were people acting on despite the conflict. Okay, I'm going to ask another question. I can't, every other people feel free to jump in here because I'm I really I've gone through this pretty carefully and I just if if the reason for um, doing it in written form is for the for the record so that yeah. there's a record and for the public, then why on earth would you keep it in your own office? Wouldn't it go into the records of the committee or the agency that you're working with? I mean, or, or yeah. you just keep serving in. If I was with the agency of transportation and I had a conflict on something, we would keep all our conflict papers in one place. Right. right. And if you're on, we have we have 300 boards and commissions, and so this also applies to the members there. Right. So if I'm a board member on the X Y Z board and I have a conflict with an and I write out this little note and then I keep it in my office. What does good does it do if I keep it in my office? Well, you shouldn't I mean, it be in the records of the commission? Yeah, it would be in the, in the, yeah, that's what I meant by my office. So if I was with the agency of transportation and I had a conflict, I would keep it in the AOT little file folder of, of conflicts that we went and worked on despite the conflict or notwithstanding the conflict. Oh, so I thought you meant that the person who had the conflict would keep it in their their office. No, that would defeat the whole purpose. Right. That's okay. Yeah. What about the possibility of someone challenging what you say in a little piece of paper? Somebody like could I, always I write, file a complaint. Okay. Um, and and well, and then and there could be a debate about whether the individuals continuing to work on the on that particular project or matter was appropriate or not appropriate. I, the, the bigger goal, I think, is to get people to be aware of when they may have conflicts and yeah. to disclose them. And if they disclose them, that's 90% of it right there. If you say, you know, I have an interest in this particular matter because of whatever, and that's out there. People forgive, it's not even a matter of forgiving it, they understand it. And, and the, I think public perception is more important with this than anything else. We want our constituents, we as Vermonters want our elected appointed uh, state government officials and underlings, whoever, to act fairly. And if we have a system where people say, I have a conflict, I need to stay out of this. If they stay out, that's the end of it. If they say, I'm going to stay in here, no, notwithstanding the conflict, then I think we have a right to know about that. And I think just the exercise of going through that creates an atmosphere where people will trust us and state government better because we're bringing up these things and we're explaining why it's okay for us to uh, continue anyway. Shouldn't the board or the commission or the agency or whoever it is that you're working with or for if you write your little note and say, I think I can be objective anyway, shouldn't the, that commission or that board or whoever acknowledge it and say, uh, yes, we agree that this makes sense and you should be able to take part or we don't agree and we're going to cut you off? 
Well, we have nothing that addresses that now. We have nothing. I mean, because that's the way, actually, that's the way it works in the Senate. If somebody well, has a conflict, they say, I have a, believe I have a conflict, and then the Senate has the right to either accept that a recusal or to say, that's just fine. We think you can be objective anyway. Right. Um, I think the challenge with that is, I mean, I, it's something to think about, but you know, let's say it's a three-person select board or something, you know, there's a lot of other interests that could This doesn't cover that. municipalities. Okay, like a three-member other board. Oh, like cannabis one, control created. board. Yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> better example. But, you know, it's just, if there's a smaller board, one vote could really, they, there could be an interest in attacking that person. Yeah, that's true. The other, and the other problem with a small group of people is if you're, you know, if you're a tightly knit group, I think the opportunity to say, oh, I trust Larry, you know, it's not a big deal, is much greater. And, and really, the underlying issue, the underlying concern is how will the public look at these things? And if they look at it as, oh, they're all just protecting themselves or their workmates, and they're just, you know, going along with the people they work with, and they don't give a hoot about us, um, that's what we're trying to avoid. And so, you know, ethics is an individual responsibility, and I don't think it's appropriate, this is my personal belief, to delegate to my coworkers the decision all the time of whether I should or should not do something. Uh, that should be my responsibility. Further down in the code where we, dis we talk about what good cause is, and it, it got separated out a little bit, good cause to proceed would be if the conflict or the potential conflict is de minimis, it's really minor, it's nothing. Or whatever I'm being called upon to do is ministerial or clerical. You know, I have to, um, I'm looking at an application for something and I have no discretion whether to grant it or not. I just have to make sure all the boxes are checked and they're all checked. Then I have no discretion. It's okay for me to, con to uh, continue. If the conflict is speculative or amorphous or intangible, it's just so out there that it really doesn't rise to the level of a real conflict, then we could say good cause exists to go ahead and do it anyway. The only time and the other time, the, the one time when there might, when a public servant might continue to do something where there is a conflict would be if there's nobody that the public servant can delegate the task to. So if I'm the only person in my office or in my department who can do something and I can't give it to anybody else to do when I have a conflict, I have to do it. So I would note the conflict. I would say, I have a conflict with this for this reason. I cannot give it away to somebody else to do. I'm going to proceed and make a decision on this. And then I make very, very clear that why I'm making the decision I am so they could see that my personal interest isn't entering into it. So we do the right thing for the right reason. We make it very clear to the public that we're doing it that way because no one else can do this. It's easy when we can recuse and give it to somebody else. And you know, I, nine out of 10 times it, that I hope would be the default. The people just say, oh, you know, I have to grant this application and it's my next door neighbor I'm going to stay away from it. I'll let somebody else do it. So yep. that's the good cause part. And I think that answers a lot of the problems with the conflict. So when there's a conflict, there are those four areas that allow you to proceed. And, uh, and so that's basically where we are. Yep. The, the other, as we go through the list, is if there is a conflict of, of interest, it can't be delegated. I can't have a conflict and, and say to my buddy in the office, hey, you take this, I can't. And I can't tell you what to do. It's like, I can't grant this application, but TG, I'd like you to grant it for me. <laughs> Absolutely cannot do that. If I recuse, I'm out. I, had, I take no further part in any consideration of it. I don't let my personal beliefs be known. I do nothing to affect the decision in any way. Um, and that way the public is protected that decisions are being made on their own merits and not because of a real, a potential conflict or something that I've 
um, stepped away from, but I'm, you know, I'm operating like the marionettes from, from backstage. Um, Madam Chair? Yeah. Senate Appropriations is ready for you. <gasps> okay. Keep on. I will be right back. Do, do I have to leave this one and then go and then come back, right? Okay. I can't remember why I'm going, but bye. Boards and commissions. Okay. Too late. Um, she figure it out when she gets there. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, what the current code says on page six, line eight, um, I can't, if I have a conflict, I can't direct someone to act in a manner that I myself would be prohibited from acting. Basically what I just said a moment ago. Um, and then the next thing is once I've recused, I can't be a part, I can't say, I can't vote on this, but here's how I feel. And this is what I think we should do. Absolutely cannot do that. If I have a conflict, I'm out of it completely um, because I cannot then be, if I stay in it, basically I'm trying to direct other people to do my bidding that I have a conflict in. And by stepping out, we tell the public that the process is fair and safe and open, and that whatever conflict Larry has is not being foisted on anyone else, and he's not asking anyone to act on his behalf. So, Larry, in the in the in the case where you know there might be uh, ten or twelve people on a board, and you're actually physically meeting, or even as we meet now virtually, does the does that mean that that person should leave the meeting at that point? Or I think so. Or, yeah. Yeah. I think so, because if, if I have a conflict and you, you know, we're in, sitting across the table from anything, I think it makes it a little more difficult for you if we have a close relationship to take a position that may be contrary to what my suspected co conflicted position would be. So I think in order to make it easier for my colleagues to make a fair and impartial decision, I should be gone. I should leave the room for that discussion. Yeah. And that way, when, when the rest of you vote, you, you can vote without having to look me and, and saying, oh, you know, and feeling, gee, I'm sorry, Larry, I'm going to vote against you on this. I should not even be a factor. So I'm out of the room. And, and we've given that advice to people this year already. What do I do when I have a conflict? Yeah, I think you're, you're right. And you I don't think, um, I think the situation, you know, how facial expressions can come into play probably more so in person, although you could certainly see in a Zoom session. I mean, if somebody's rolling their eyes and going, whoa, man, that's a pretty clear indication of how you feel about something. Right. Um, so I think you're right. I think you ought to leave. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Um, the next thing on, on page line 16 of page 6 is the appearance of conflict. And that's pretty much the same thing. If you have an appearance of conflict, the public doesn't know whether it's real or it's not, but if it looks terrible, it is terrible. And again, most of this, a lot of this, is how does the public view what we are doing in our jobs? And if it looks like we're acting when we have conflicts, we're not gaining public support. We're not in any way um, assuring the public that we're acting on their behalf. So. Um, in some ways, it seems like the appearance is almost not worse than the actuality, but it's just as bad as the appearance because the whole idea is to not undermine faith in government. Exactly. If people don't believe in what you're doing or they, you, it's an appearance that you're doing something unethical, it's as good as if you actually were being unethical. Yeah, maybe even worse in some right. ways, um, depending on it. Yeah. So the appearance of impropriety is huge. And you know, if it, all you have to do, and all any of us have to do is read the paper where somebody's speculating about somebody's motives. And you know, we just need to be very attuned to that. So um, on page seven, the next section is preferential treatment. Um, this is pretty straightforward. Um, I can't treat my friends better than I treat people that I may not like. You know, I can't. Um, I have to act independently and fairly and consistently, and I cannot um, show favor or prejudice towards anybody in what I'm doing. If, if there's something before me to decide, 
I have to decide it on the merits. And if the, the applicant or the person before me is wealthy or poor, it shouldn't make a difference. If it's a person with a lot of political influence or none, that should make more no difference at all. We need to make decisions for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. Now, how does that affect you as legislators when you, know, you have constituents who want you to do things? Um, the answer is that in voting and making decisions that you make uh, as lawmakers, those things are protected by the Vermont Constitution. And, and they can't be questioned outside. But to get to your point earlier, if you take a bribe, absolutely a big, big problem. Um, so can you give preference to um, particular people in your jurisdictions when you're voting on something? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as long as you're doing it for a good reason and not for an improper reason, because you know they're, they're making direct deposits into your bank account or something. Mm -hmm. Misuse of position, this goes for everybody. Um, so you can't use your own position for personal or financial gain. You know, you, I can't um, call, I don't know, the Lost Nation Theater and say, not that it would make a difference that, you know, I'm Larry Novins from the Ethics Commission. Do you have free tickets for me? Or, or, you know, somebody else, you can't use your position to do that. I mean, you know, I think it would be improper to call a restaurant and say, hi, I'm Senator so-and-so, and it's Saturday night at six o'clock, do you have a table for four and a half an hour? That would be misuse your position. I, I, I watched um, Al Franken once on being interviewed, and, and he used to do this thing when he was walking through the Capitol when he was still a senator. And he would walk by people and say, excuse me, I'm more important than you. I'm more important than you. And everybody knew it was a joke. But if you don't know, and, and you're the people whose table is bumped at 7 o'clock because some important person in state government has used their position to get their dinner that doesn't help any of us in state government. Um, it really is a very simple thing. Um, but if, if we want to do anything to engender distrust or, or the feeling they're only in it for themselves, then misusing our positions for things like that is the easiest way to do it. Um, well, there may be a tenuous connection but with my example. And I think everybody, all of us, have probably done this at once, once, once upon a time. If you have a constituent that's sort of having trouble getting through the layers of government bureaucracy, I have picked the phone up before and gone straight to the commissioner or secretary and said, hey, it's Senator Collimore, I need you to focus on this particular issue for me on behalf of this constituent. And sometimes it works and, and sometimes it doesn't. Right. But, um, you know, the, the ability to do that, I think, is very important. That's why I think the five of us enjoy being elected because we can help people with a particular problem. Whether you feel in your heart of hearts that that also translates into a future vote, I guess is between you and and whoever, but you know what I'm saying? There, there could be sort of a tenuous connection between, it's not for personal gain at the time, it's for a constituent's gain, but the truth of the matter is, it probably will reflect well on you uh, the next time they go to vote too. I, I mean, I think that needs to at least be out in the open. No, I think you that's know. a good point. Because I think, and also that's the part of the job in a way. Yeah, so I, I would that, say that part of the job is trying to help your constituents. Right. It, and I, uh, I would consider that not being for personal gain. You know, yeah. if, if you make a call on behalf of a constituent, you're not making personal gain. It may be ultimately in your interest to do that. Um, because your interest is in being an effective representative of your constituents. But it's, I make a distinction between that and saying, I want a dinner reservation at seven o'clock, which is clearly yeah. for you and no one else. Yeah, no TJ Jones, I don't know if you have a different view on that or? Uh, no, I have the exact same view, but I, I did want to assure the committee that um, although there's no Vermont law that I can find on point on this issue, there is 
fairly vibrant federal law that the type of things that you're talking about, constituent services, fall squarely within your role as legislators and would be protected under the speech and debate clause. Uh, even, even if you were acting on behalf of a, a constituent, you know, for the hope of a future vote or, or whatever, it still falls squarely within your role as a legislator and would be exempt from scrutiny. Thanks, TJ. So the next section would be uh, misuse of information. This is section seven, line 10 on page seven. Um, it's, it's to me, is I think a no brainer that it, there are times in our positions where we have confidential information, information that is not available to the public. We can't use that for our own personal gain. It's pretty simple, it's like insider trading. Um, yeah. So we can't use it for personal financial or personal gain of, of me or anyone else. So if, if you knew, uh, and I don't know when or if anything ever comes before you that's confidential, but if you were to call a constituent and say, hey, there's something coming our way that isn't public yet, you might want to buy this stock today, that would be barred um, by this section. Again, pretty common sense. I'm sorry? Insider trading. Exactly. Exactly. You aren't allowed to use information so where you have a personal gain. That we get that is pretty basic. Yep. Um, section eight on the same page, misuse of government um, resources. So you can't use state materials, funds, property, personnel, facilities for any other purpose than for official state pur purpose unless it's permitted or required by law or written institutional department, institutional policy or rule. So an example would be, I can't go to my copier in my office and do you know, eat all my Christmas cards, my holiday cards. That's pretty easy. Um, if, I had, if I had staff, I wouldn't be able to ask my staff to go pick up my laundry someplace. Um, that would be misuse of, of that for personal use. Um, if I had a government car, um, I would not be able to take it on the weekend and go up to Lake Memphremagog to go camping. Um, if, if I had a car and it said, you know, you have to go to a particular place or you're allowed to bring it home in case you're called in the middle of the night to go on duty and there's a, a policy that allows that, fine. Um, and then, then I could use that official car to go home. But um, again, it's, it's pretty straightforward is that, you know, the, the things that we have access to as public servants are for the use of the public and for the benefit of the public, not for ourselves. I mean, all these things come down to almost invariably, what are we doing for ourselves or people we know well versus our duty to the, to the people we serve, uh, Vermonters. And we always keep that in mind that whenever we're looking at those two things, it's the Vermonter's interest, the public's interest that is paramount. And anytime we put our, our interests first, either in granting preferential treatment or using information or using uh, resources, we're violating that public trust. And these are pretty straightforward. I it can't all, it all seems so non-controversial. I'm sorry? It all seems so non-controversial. I think it is. I think it is. I mean, I think 99% of this should be a no-brainer. I mean, we can right. we can talk about how it's going to be applied and who it should or should not ap apply to, and I, those are legitimate discussions. Um, but in terms of the do's and the don'ts, these I think are very non-controversial. I, I can't imagine anybody who would think that it's proper to use government resources for your own personal benefit. Well, sadly, too many people haven't taken it to heart, mostly federally. But I mean. It, 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 but it is a no-brainer. I completely agree. Yeah. Um, next section is gifts. Um, and I have to say we struggled a little bit with this. The ob obviously gifts are, can be problematic. If people are giving you gifts, that raises the whole specter of why and what do they expect for it. Um, and so gifts are generally prohibited. Um, and this is on page eight. Um, unless covered by an exception, a public servant shall not accept a gift under circumstances where it could be inferred that accepting that gift is intended, intended to influence the person in their duties. So, um, you know, campaign contributions, 
whole separate thing. They don't count. Um, Which is what's that? Well, it is interesting. I mean, those are gifts. Yeah, they are, um, but they're they're permitted by law. Right. So, so, and it, it's, so certain gifts are okay, but uh, and free gift. I mean, uh, and 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 free gifts, like you know, when when in agriculture, if if an apiary, an apiarist comes and brings little jars of honey to everybody, it, you know, if that's a gift and it's under ten dollars, that's fine. Right. So, in a perfect world, it would be nice if there was a simple blank rule. Right. Um, but we don't live in a perfect world. And a simple blank rule would be say no gifts. So if somebody brought you a jar of funny, you'd say, that's wonderful. I wish I could take it, but I can't. No, you'd say um, that's sweet. Exactly. Um, so what we put in this is if it's $20 or less, it's okay as long as over the course of a year, um, gifts from a particular person don't exceed that $20 limit. So, I mean, uh, it would be a lot easier if we just said no gifts. It would make it so much simpler. But uh, in the real world, I think that would be really hard. Can you remind okay, me, come does, to mind. does this exclude statewide office holders? No, does they are absolutely okay. included. Okay, well, because then what, I mean, what I've always understood the President of the United States has to do, for example, is if they want to receive a gift worth a certain amount, they just have to pay for it. Um, and so the president can look through the gifts they've received and say, yeah, I, ca I can't accept any of this, but I really like this, you know, really nice wooden piece, you know, and so tell me the value so I can pay for it. I imagine it would probably only be the governor and some of the statewide office holders for whom that would apply, but I don't know if that matters to anybody. I just think there are times, especially with foreign governments, where you might want to accept a gift. Yeah, I, I don't okay. know if the governor gets a gift, say, from China or some foreign country, whether that belong becomes the governor's personal property or not. I suspect that that gift is property of the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then it's not an, an issue. Um, if I'm wrong, so those, it's not the case, gifts, then we need to look at that some more. Because those gifts are certainly unsolicited. I know when the, the lieutenant governor and the governor like used Taiwan as an example. They got like loads of stuff from Taiwan all the time, just sending them stuff. Like sometimes it was cake, sometimes it'd be like a, a, a key holder, or whatever it might be, a keychain. I mean, all kinds of things. Yeah. And it'd be more of a pain to like, you know, what do you need to just send it back? I mean, it's like, right. you know, it seems right. like it's not worth the effort to send back or, or to deal with. So you just sort of let it sit in your office and ignore it. Yeah. Mr. Jones, you had your hand up. I did. I, I hate to interrupt. I, I just wanted to draw uh, Senator Rom's attention to uh, the statute that is cited there, 2 VSA 261. And it has a specific exemption that says, you know, if, if you pay for something out of pocket, it is not a gift. It falls outside the definition. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. I forgot. Do we need to be more clear? I mean, I'm fine with that. I don't know, unless it I comes think that's, up. I think that's fine. good. Yeah, that's that that's clear. I mean, I think that's where is that clear and, and addresses Keisha's concern. Not in the bill, right? You know, there is always uh, some diplomatic thing where you're going to get a gift that's going to be more than twenty dollars, or and you can either choose to pay for it yourself, or you can keep it on behalf of the state of Vermont and share it with everybody. I guess. Right. To Senator Polina's question, the definition of gift. Uh, in the front part of the statute says gift is as it's defined in 2 BSA. Oh, okay, in the definitions part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And which is fine as long as 2 BSA, was it 261? Yes. Um, isn't amended. If it's amended, then it'll change the ethics code. So um, we had originally copied the provisions of that gift statute into the code so that it would remain if the other one is, was changed. Um, you know, right now, I don't think it makes any difference, but if anybody ever wants to amend that Title II section, we need to be very aware that it will affect the ethics code. Um, so, so just something to keep in mind. At some point, I wonder, Larry, whether the value will have to change. Um, yeah. 
something yeah. that's worth 20 bucks today in five years may be nothing. Right. And, you know, that would certainly be appropriate if you feel that the $20 limit is appropriate. And if um, the people I heard on the radio earlier say that we're in for some inflation, then maybe in, in, in a few years that that would properly be changed. Yeah. I mean, $20 20 years ago is certainly not what $20 is today. So should we should we put a trigger in to, for it to be reviewed in every 10 years? I, I, I my. I, I think yeah. my personal belief would be to leave it alone and if and when it becomes a problem, then deal with it. And my whole thing on this bill is to try and keep it as simple as possible so that we don't get into too many details and too many fine points. I mean, I think the basic do's and don'ts, as I think we agree, are pretty straightforward. Um, well, I think the ethics commission is going to be reporting to the legislature on an annual basis. That's the kind of thing that would be raised in the report. Yeah, then it's time to change the threshold. Right, and I'm sure that we would hear from people in state government if they said, I got a $30 gift and it's worth nothing. <laughs> you know, it's barely a movie ticket. Yeah. Um, then, you know, we would hear about it and you would hear about it. But Senator it, Clarkson? Thank you. In all fairness, sometimes when you're given a gift, you have no idea what its value is. Sure. I mean, if you're given a silk scarf in Taiwan, you know, what value do you actually uh, value it at? The, the cost of production, the cost of the retail, the cost of what they got it for? I mean, you know, so, I mean, we don't even necessarily always know what the value is. Right. Well, I think I that so. raises a whole other I'm point. Sorry. Which, oh, sorry. I think I'm gonna have to go. <laughs> Did they just ask for you? No, but you're back. So I, they said to, they said it would be immediately following you. So okay, they are asking for you, Senator Polina. I'll be back soon. Thank you. There, there's been a, I think it's been really fuzzy for a long time about legislators being able to accept airfare, et cetera, to go on trips and who that comes from. I know it's legislators, but I don't. I don't know. Maybe you know. There's sister cities from. You know. I know this doesn't apply to municipalities. I'm just saying we've been invited in the past on lots of trips, and I don't know that we've ever had a good policy around that. Boy, I've never been invited to go on a trip. <laughs> oh really? No. We were all invited to go to Turkey, remember? And some people took that gift. And, that might have been before Senator Collimore's time. They have oh, not been as active. In Taiwan too. Taiwan, exactly. And those are trips are fully paid for. That's why they're called junkets. Right. And I, I haven't given that any thought. And I don't know how you deal with that now or how you want to deal with it in the future. Again, my view on the, on what we have here. Wait, is can I just ask where you are so that I can catch up? We're on yeah. page uh, nine. nine or 10. We're in <laughs> gifts. Thank you. OK. Maybe we're in, uh, yeah, we're on page sort of nine-ish, I think, aren't okay. we? Yeah. All right. Okay, Larry, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Um, so, you know, th this idea of junkets and where they come from. Um, we, on page nine, on line 16, it says, a public servant may accept a gift of attendance at training or similar events approved by a public servant supervisor and determined to be in the interest of the public servant's agency or department. Yeah, and you know what? That's the way it operates now. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the speaker and the pro tem decide uh, who, I mean, generally on most of these th things, they decide who's being invited, who is the appropriate diplomatic representative from our body to represent the legislature. And they are all representing the, generally, they are all representing the legislature yeah. in some public function. So as, as long as there's a way to keep track of that, it doesn't need to involve the ethics commission, but as long as there's a, a means by which appropriate trips are, are engaged in, um, that's fine. We don't need to go through that. Um, Can I go back up to line four? Have you already talked about that? Um, yes, the market value. We did well, a little bit because I raised the question about who values it and at what, well, and at what value. If some if if somebody gives me wants to give me a 
$50 ticket to a, a game because they have a ticket. And I say, well, I can't accept anything over $20. So I will pay the other $30. Why yeah, would that to. not be acceptable? It is. I asked that question and it is in the underlying statute. You can pay the fair market value of something over $20 and then it's no But longer. here it says the public servant shall not pay the excess value. Oh, it says In order that. to accept. Yeah. On line four and five. Yeah, but then Larry showed us where we could. So now are they in conflict? Well, not if it's okayed by your supervisor agency. But it doesn't... It, it, it doesn't say that. Right. It says where the market value is over $20, the public servant shall not pay the excess value over $20 and owe to accept it. That's very clear. You shouldn't, you can't do that. I would favor allowing them to be able to do that and pay the excess amount. I yeah. think TJ, Tom, did you have a, are you TJ or Tom? Uh, TJ is great. Okay. I've been called many worse things. So TJ is just. <laughs> well, we'll refrain from that. Um, as, as written right now, uh, uh, the statute contemplates that you can accept something, whether it's $25, $30, $40, $100, $100, if you pay the whole thing. But what it doesn't allow, as written now, is to essentially take a $20 discount on whatever is offered you. If somebody offers you a $40 ticket um, with the, the idea that you'll pay $20 for it to get it down below the mark, that's not allowed under the current rule. You would have to pay $40 for the whole ticket. And why would that be? Yeah, that's the way it's written now. I'm not. I'm not trying to justify the language. There are states that do allow paydowns to get it under the limit set forth in statute, um, but there's also. Uh, this is uh, uh, off the top of my head. I can't recall what other states, but there are other states that prohibit uh, sort of discount paydowns. But that, that's that's how it's often currently phrased and should be interpreted. Hmm. Okay, well, we can think about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't yeah, know. If we're that... not making decisions today, so we're clearly marking areas that, that we have questions, you know, ongoing things to think about. Right. Um, the next section on top of page 10, unauthorized comments. Um, I'm sorry? Commitments? I yeah, Larry, you said comments. Commitments. I thought it was comments. <laughs> it's okay. I was looking for unauthorized comments, and I make a lot of those myself. I was going to say, actually, I think that was the change. Proposing we can't do those. Um, let me check. Uh, that may I may not have noticed that. Um, no, it says commitments. It right. does. I, I thought it said comments. No. Nope. And I'm trying to figure out. Um, okay, just a moment. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, so um, it, it, people should not make comments or promises that bind the state of Vermont unless they're authorized to do so. Right. Commitment. Commitments. Commitment, I keep, sorry, I keep making that mistake. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I had a hard time yesterday with a sentence. But you said it well today. Right. Um, then outside employment is the next one. Um, shouldn't have seek or engage in outside employment that's inconsistent, incompatible, or in conflict with your official duties. That's fairly straightforward. Um, and then we have a section on post-government employment. And this is basically the revolving door thing. Um, <clears throat> and what it says is there, when you leave state government, there's a period of time where you can't come back uh, before the people you worked with and try and advocate for them to do things. I mean, that's grossly oversimplifying it, but the idea, the problem with it is, I mean, the problem with the revolving door is the public looks at it and they say, well, this person was in the legislature, this person worked in AOT, 
And he gets out, and the next day he's back trying to influence his old buddies to change something. And two questions. One is, does he have undue influence over the people he used to work with? And two, when he was still working there, whose side was he really on? <laughs> yeah, no, it raises the question. Yeah, and, and that to me is probably the more dangerous of the two, is we want to be assured that people who are working in state government are working for the state of Vermont and not using their position to get a job that's going to pay a lot of money when they leave. Let, uh, Senator Colmar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so Larry, is the one year uh, length of time fairly standard in other uh, states? I'll defer to TJ on that. Just a question. I'm not trying to advocate for anything more or less than that. Just wondering. I'm going to throw, this is already in law. Right. This isn't. We already have this. And, and the one year for um, executive officers came from the governor's executive order. And for legislators, you'll write and see that it's two years. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know when two years got enacted because it's been functional as one year. No, not for legislators. It's always been to, until the end of the biennium session following their retirement, their departure. I'm sure that's what it's always been. I'm, I don't, I don't have it in front of me. I'm not sure, but it makes okay. sense that if you're like, if you were to leave right now, halfway through the biennium, it would be very inappropriate for you to be appearing in, you know, in front of your former colleagues in, in January. Right. And that cooling off period should encompass one full biennium after your departure. Right. I, I think that that's, I, I'd love to double check that because we, we've had several former colleagues who have started uh, lobbying sooner than that. Yes, but most of them did that before we passed that law. It was in the executive order for executive officers, but not for legislators. We, we worked on that only a couple of years ago. Yes, I, I think the first by any I was in the Senate. Yeah, I, I, I think it's good. I think that's appropriate the full biennium, but it's okay. Yeah, I, I assume you're right. You're usually right. Well, it doesn't actually, it doesn't make any difference if it's current law or not. This is the suggestion now. Yeah. yeah. And if I may say so, I think it's a good idea. Right. What? So you're, you're potentially not um, addressing all the same people that you served with. There right. might be new people there that you're, in fact, there might be a complete turnover, all new people. Yeah. Not highly unlikely, but, but again, we know it'll be at least a third. Yeah. And, and again, I think it's the perception from the outside that you've used your position to go back and, uh, and influence your former colleagues. Or more importantly, that, you know, the question is whose side were you on when you were serving a month ago? or just one year ago. Um, so putting that breathing space in, I think assures the public that uh, we're not misusing our positions and we're not uh, um, acting on our own behalf or on, on someone else's behalf when we should be acting for the state. Senator Colomar. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Larry, if uh, someone steps down this summer, it's really only a year because the biennium would end. No, the, the next biennium. Oh, is that how that's worded? I'm. I think sorry. so. Um, the end of the biennial <laughs> session following the legislature departure. Right, because it's a different biennium biennial session. I think. Uh, okay. The way I read this, I think Senator Colomar might be right. It's the end of the biennial session following the departure. If the departure is in July, the biennial, the end of the biennial session following that departure would be in December of 2022. There wouldn't be a full two year by, I think that's, that's the way why, I read it. That's why I raised the question. I wasn't yeah. sure reading that, whether someone could literally step down this summer and get a job in state government on January 1st, 2023. Or not, not in state government, but as a lobbyist. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, we spent a lot of time working on that and maybe okay. we still didn't get it right. No, but I'm my sure. thought was that you're in a biennial session now. Right. And the biennial session following your departure is the next one. And it would be after that one that it would be okay to, to lobby, but not before then. So I, I, when I say the biennial session following your departure, that would be the next full biennial session. So you're, you're thinking January of 25. If I resigned today, what you're saying is I couldn't be a lobbyist until January 25. Correct. I don't think that's as clear as it needs to be. Yeah. Well, maybe I, what we should I, say. I think Brian's right. I think that uh, that, yeah. that needs to be clear. And and do we also? I just haven't gotten there yet. Are we able? Be, because um, often, as you know, let's say a political party gains the governorship, and we uh, there are always there's an exodus of legislators taking those executive jobs. Do we? Are we still able to do that? Or are we yes. now looking at no, you uh, can do that. ability to go yes. straight into state government after you've been a legislator? Yeah, you can. Yeah. It says you shall not be an advocate for anyone other than the state. Oh, so, great. OK, and sorry, where's that? It's on line 16 on page 10. Oh, right, there it is. 16 and right. 16. So that would be covered. And I think we had a lot of conversation before about limiting employment and that we didn't necessarily want to do that either going from the legislature to the administration or from the administration to the legislature. Right. Although, as we all know, members of the administration lobby us often. Yes, but that's in for the state. That's okay. It says it here. I I realize, I'm just saying. Well, that's their job is to lobby for the executive branch. That's what I'm doing right now. And and they're not they're and they're actually not pay, they're not listed as registered lobbyists. They're lobbying I realize because of their position. I realize. Just saying. But I think part of the rationale, Senator Clarkson, was we're so so small a state, and the available pool of candidates is is small. And if you if you tighten it too much, you don't allow for anybody to do anything. I I, I totally agree. It's just yeah, I know. It's it's basically the same thing. It's it's just different employer and hopefully higher you know different purpose. But but I yeah and, and it, it is but you couldn't say if you were in the legislature you can't lobby you can't come before the legislature as a, an employee of the state but if you weren't in the legislature you can come before the um, legislature I mean yeah anyway I, uh, wait. so I just think you need to clarify I mean, some of your favorite question. people Allison some of your favorite people have. Uh, taken that position many of our favorite people <laughs> many uh, uh, many of our favorite people and former colleagues mm -hmm. state so government I'm, is full I'm, of our former colleagues um, um i'm sure we could come up with language to clarify right. yeah to respond to senator collimore's thoughts and maybe it's until the end of the next full biennial session <clears throat> following uh departure from the general assembly something like that yeah. Yeah. Would, that would really cover. creates a, at, at, you'll know that at minimum it's two years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I can suggest that. Um, and then legislative branch employees, this is only people who work for the legislative branch, just one year for them, um, because I think the risk of, of their having unfair influence is much lower than um, a former colleague. So. Um, we did get a bunch of comments from people saying, well, I work for ANR, and if I leave, does this mean I can't contract uh, with ANR or with the state of Vermont if I'm an engineer or you know something like that? 
And so we put in this section on page 11, line five, um, that if people have contracts with the state of Vermont, that's permitted. The state of Vermont can contract with them. We didn't want to disenfranchise anybody from their area of employment. So, um, and then on section five, representation restrictions. Um, Would you explain that a little bit? I have a question yeah. mark beside that. Okay. Um, if I was part of a, let's say when I used to work at OPR, uh, if I was part of a prosecution or a decision making on a, a disciplinary matter, um, and then I left state government, I wouldn't be able to come back regarding that matter, no matter what, for no period of time. It would be a permanent exclusion, just with regard to a matter that I'd been intimately involved with. Um, we, just for the, the sanctity of the, the matter, the investigation, that if I was involved in investigation and misconduct, um, I couldn't then come back a year later representing the person who was being investigated. I've already sort of cast my lot uh, with the state on that one. And it's so closely tied to my state employment and what I did with the state that the, the sanctity of it would be destroyed by me taking another side and appearing at all. So if I'm intimately involved in an investigation, a request for rulemaking, something like that, I can't go ask, work for the people who are under investigation or asking for a rule change. So you can't work for the other side, but you could, you're a material witness. I mean, you are an expert now in the, the side that you work for with the state. I mean, if, if you continue to- if, I, I think so. If I was called as a witness, that would probably be okay. Right. Um, I mean, the- it, But maybe it, not. Um, and again, it, it was, it's like litigation. If I was involved, intimately involved in litigation in a particular matter, then I couldn't be involved on anybody's behalf later on, and nor should I be. Yeah, and I wouldn't be a material witness in that sense. I mean, if I had subject matter uh, information, that would be another thing. Yeah, but you have subject matter expertise. And if it isn't a legal issue, Surely you're of infinite value to a committee or to anyone who needs expert testimony on, on something, even if you'd love state government. I would think you would be you'd be a huge resource. Again, to go to Brian's point, we're a tiny state. Right. We don't have that many right. experts in those areas. Well, the I limitation, this, I'm sorry. I think it's very, I might be reading this wrong, but on line 13, it says you can't appear before the entity of the state on behalf of any person. So you can you you could be a wit an expert witness, but you couldn't come in and appear on behalf of that person that you were um, involved with. Is that what is that the way I'm reading this? Yeah, other than the state. Other than the state. Yeah. <clears throat> so I couldn't flip sides. Right. It's the flipping sides that's the problem, not yeah. the Okay. Right. So if the state called me, that would be one thing. But I couldn't flip side and go for the other side. So, okay. Now that I have a son who's a state's attorney, what happens if you leave state government and instead of you, maybe you had worked in the AG's office, our prosecutor, and all of a, then you go and work for the defender general's office. I mean, aren't you able to flip sides there? Yeah, but as long as you're not working for the same person. I mean, I had that happen. Um, and I know that's had that frequently happen. Some a former public defender becomes yeah, a state's attorney or vice versa. That's okay, but you can't be on the same case. So um, you couldn't, you know, somebody couldn't be my lawyer and then go join the AG's office and prosecute me. Okay. Thanks. And there, and, uh, and if we're talking about lawyers, you know, there's the whole lawyer's ethics code that prohibits uh, use of confidential information, et cetera, against uh, former clients without their yeah. consent or disclosure. Oh, right, absolutely. So those are, I mean, I'm, I don't think my description has done this really justice, but I mean, uh, the representation restrictions are really very limited 
to those situations where you play an active role in one particular matter to prevent you from flipping and taking the other side when you get out. And it's the same thing as the revolving door. It creates two problems. One is um, you're using, you may be using information you had on the inside against the state, which isn't good. And the other is um, whose side was this person working on before they left? Why did they flip and go for the other side? So it really, um, I think, protects the integrity of the proceeding to know that somebody who's working for the state in a particular matter can't go and then come back against the state in that one particular matter. <clears throat> um, the next section on page 12 is section 12. Basically says we all have to abide by the law, um, including anti-discrimination and equal opportunity laws and comply with applicable governmental codes of conduct. Um, and then if there are any agency rules or executive orders that we're supposed to comply with, then we do that as well. And then under section D on section on line nine, um, this is the part that went back to what we were talking about earlier about conflicts of interest. And this is where the statutory drafting makes this a little confusing. But when we were talking about be only because it's out of order. So if you have a conflict of interest, um, you recuse or you determine if there's good cause and this D um, outlines what good cause is. And this is what we talked about earlier. But it, does this say that the um, the State Ethics Commission, the, the person or the person's supervisor would request a determination, right? It isn't, there isn't a determination in every instance. No, 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 okay. no. That would be the rare exception. It would be, say, if, if I uh, felt I had a conflict of anything, but my supervisor said, no, Larry, you don't, then the, in that situation, they could ask the Ethics Commission if my finding of a conflict that was well-founded or not. So I would imagine this would happen extremely rarely. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't include, we, before we had talked about the idea that somebody could challenge you, your decision about whether or not you have a conflict or not. And I asked whether somebody could challenge that. And you said, yeah, it could lead towards a hearing or what have you. If I thought you were doing something wrong or that you, 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 that you choose not to recuse yourself because you think you have a good cause to continue forward, I, as just a, a legislator, for example, could not ask the Ethics Commission to decide whether or not you're abiding by the good cause or not. Correct. But you could file a complaint against me huh. once we get to right. that stage where we take complaints and, right. and that might trigger a complaint. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the idea is, it, you know, and, and this would apply to legislative branch, I think probably almost, ex well, most more than anybody else, is if you had somebody who said, I can't do this, I have a conflict, and their boss says, I don't see the conflict, I'm going to ask the Ethics Commission for a second opinion, then they could do that. Oh, I see it. That would be... Would, the would it work the other way also? I don't have a conflict, and my boss says, oh, yes, you do. Um, hadn't thought of that, but I would imagine that my boss would have other recourse. Um, like if he's my, he or she is my boss, she could say, Larry, you're off this. And I would have to go along with that because that would be a condition of my employment. Okay, yeah. Um, on page 13, section C, um, what this does is give whistleblower protection for ethics complaints. So in very much the way there is whistleblower protection in uh, 3 VSA 971, um, there would be uh, whistleblower protections for ethics complaints as well. And then on section F, <clears throat> Um, would be provisions for mandatory ethics training. And the hope would be that there would be mandatory training uh, for all new employees 
um, within their first 120 days, they would get some kind of ethics training. And each department would keep track and keep records to make sure that their employees had been adequately or appropriately trained. And the training would be either in person or online. I would think that an introductory training for state government could be a very simple, maybe one or an hour and a half online training session. I've seen some that states use and they're pretty good. And we could do that with, I think, relative ease and very little expense. Um, and then for, we could have continuing education um, once every three years, again, could be in person or online. And approved ethics providers would be the Ethics Commission, um, CAPS, the Department of Human Services, um, the House and Senate ethics panels, if they want to give trainings for their own members, um, and any other um, education providers approved by the Ethics Commission. So we'd have a little leeway if somebody else came along and said, we've got a great ethics program. If we felt that was appropriate, we could say, yeah, that would be an acceptable ethics program. But I think the idea is, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. Uh, the idea is to make sure that when people join state government that they realize that there are ethical considerations for everything we do starting on day one. And then a reminder, you know, every three years or however often is appropriate, um, just to brush up and go through those things again so that ethics is somewhere near the front of our mind when we're going about our daily affairs. So I would, I would uh, modify this a little bit so that um, legislators would receive some training at the beginning of end, every biennium. Because every yeah. three years doesn't make any sense at all with a two-year biennium mm -hmm. election yeah. cycle. And we are required to do every biennium um, sexual harassment training, um, <clears throat> implicit bias training, and I believe we should be required to do charm school classes, but um, so far I can't get that put in place. But a charm mm -hmm. school, charm school could marry with ethics. No, I don't think so. Okay. Charm, school, charm school is very ethics, <clears throat> I, I, and I think that we have um, legislators who don't understand the uh, the right kind of unspoken um, anyway. Ooh, the the traditions and stuff of the Senate. Right. And we go through this every every biennium, but except so we I would just put year. it there that at the beginning of every biennium there should be some training by the legislature. Here, here. And I and guess I, I guess my concern is we don't have anything about our other public servant bodies. So we don't have anything here about working with Vermont League of Cities and Towns to make sure that every uh, every select board gets this. Every municipality gets this. This should we, be. We have never. We have not gone to municipalities okay. yet, purposely. Talk about public servants here. No, they are not defined as municipalities. They're state public, public servants. servants. We have not. This does not extend to municipalities. Only to state public servants. So this is a state code of ethics. Yes. Normal people, normal people would understand that as applying to everybody in the state. I don't think so. I do. Okay. Well, I mean, it if doesn't. I it was a state law. I wouldn't think, oh, that's just a state law for legislators. I'd think that's a state law for everybody. Well, if you look at the affected body, the affected people, it, said, it clearly says um, all appointed or elected officials of the state, persons elected as members of the General Assembly, state employees, persons appointed to serve on state boards and commissions, and persons who are um, authorized to speak on behalf of the state. It does not cover municipalities, and we have purposely not gone there. Okay. So do we... Does do you know? Does anybody know if the Vermont League of Cities and Towns has a code of ethics for? Yes. They don't have a. <clears throat> they have a model code of ethics, and they're encouraging their towns to adopt code of ethics, but they can't tell them that they have to. And um, okay. no, many. No, we. Well, I think this is a different conversation. Okay. I get it. I get that it's a different conversation. It's just to me that. 
it, it if we're making this a stat a law for I mean yeah okay it's a it's a, it's a different conversation. it's a different conversation got it but I didn't mean to shut you down but we spent okay. a lot of time debating this a couple of years ago no I I remember this vaguely but I think we should have it after we get this up and running. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. What about yeah. what about regional government, like nope. regional planning commissions, and they're not covered because they're not state. Okay. This is only a state employees and officers code of ethics. Am I right, Larry? Yes. Yep. So, what about things like the? Arts Council or the State Arts Council or the State Humanities yeah. Council or historic, you know, the other state bodies that are. It says state boards and commissions. Okay, great. State board. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. That's at the beginning. This that would mean having to go all the way back. Yes, it's on the very beginning under applicability. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Thanks for that reminder. Yep. And I didn't mean to jump there, but we no, do not want to have this conversation now. But I think once we establish this as a model code of ethics, I hope that others will adopt it. Well, and the VLCT does have one. Great. And many, many towns have adopted their own. They, yeah, I'm, I've, I've looked into that. We, we actually have a lot of those. We posted them on our website in case people were interested in them. Um, there are a few towns or cities that have really nice ethics code, but it's a handful. Um, and the uh, other towns, the uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns created a policy, but it's very aspirational and uh, it's um, not hugely helpful. I've gotten calls from people in towns saying, what do we do? And my response was, well, what are you using? And they said, we have this policy that we adopted and I just, I said, well, take a look at our code. And if you want to adopt something like our code, go ahead. Um, it, you know, it's a good model. And, yeah. and I, I agree someday it would be a, a great conversation to have, but. Yeah. Great. Um, we'll so, have it later. <laughs> yeah. One of the questions we didn't discuss um, today is, and, and maybe just because nobody's questioned it, but it was in the comments we received. Um, is whether this should apply to um, non-judicial functioning in the judicial branch. You know, so um, I was thinking, well, the, the, the Constitution has an exclusion for judges, much as what you do as legislators is insulated from or isolated from, uh, from discussion by other people and constitutionally protected judges when they're judging cases um, have that protection for their jobs as well. Um, the question is, should the code apply to state employees other than judges who work in the judicial branch? And, and I was just thinking some of the things that they do um, are very, very much the same as what happens in the executive branch. You know, they, they have contracts, they hire people, they have IT, they do payroll, um, they, they have custodial staff, they own buildings, um, they purchase computers and programs, they do all these things. Um, they have the same temptations that, that we have in the executive branch or the legislative branch about using personal equipment, using private information. There are lots of people who aren't judges, who aren't making decisions, who have the same ethical considerations that, that everyone else in state government does. And uh, I think our position would be that the, the code should apply to people who aren't deciding cases and acting in a judicial manner. Um, I think if you look at the comments we received, we did receive a comment from the judicial branch uh, saying that they should not be covered. Um, but I think the arguments for including them are, are stronger than the arguments for excluding them. Um, it's just like the Department of Human Resources. They don't really have a position on the ethics code because it's separate and apart from what they do. They do employer-employee relationships. 
And in the judicial branch, it's one thing to have an employer-employee relationship. It's another thing to determine whether somebody is you know, using private information for personal gain or misusing their position for some other thing, which is the same for everybody in government, regardless of branch. Um, and I, I don't think, uh, uh, it seems to me as a matter of, of efficiency and accountability um, that the standard for people other than judges should be the same throughout state government. And I know in, in the response that TJ drafted on April 9th and sent to you or April, after April 9th addressed that. And, um, and in fact, uh, ethics commissions or ethics laws in, in some other states do encompass non-judicial uh, appointees. Actually, in a couple of states, they, they include judicial appointees or judicial people because they're elected, um, but that's the rare exception, um, except for probate judges. And probate. I was gonna say, we, we have elected judges here. Yes, right. But they're not state, why? They're not state elected judges, they're county. Right. So they're not covered under here. Right. So I, I would support <clears throat> that proposal, Larry. I think that's absolutely appropriate for, for administrative staff in the judicial branch. I think that's absolutely appropriate. Can I, I, I think we'd have to have a lot of conversation about that with the judiciary, because if you look on in the Constitution, it clearly says the Supreme Court shall make and promulgate rules governing the administration. Oh, Jeanette, you've frozen up again. Oh, no, we've lost her. Yeah, usually she disappears after this. <laughs> it was about to say administration. Yeah, uh, she's basically saying the cut there's there. there um... There's a rule by the Constitution. A hiccup, a hiccup in the Constitution that we'll have to figure out what to do about. Okay. And I wasn't sure, Larry, if if what you had said before that most states or, or only some states covered the judiciary workers. Yeah, I'll let TJ address that. Um, but yeah, I think um, on page three of the memo or page two of the memo. Uh, that TJ drafted, he he addressed uh, whether judicial employees are you back to covered that? by the code. I guess I got I I didn't I lose my internet, off. but I got kicked oh. off again. Look, I didn't even have to call you. You got back all on your own. <laughs> so we were we were still talking about the judiciary question, and we I asked whether it was unusual for in other states to cover the judiciary workers or not. Well, can I did I did you hear what I read from the Constitution? Not all of it. Oh, not all of it. You got cut off mid sentence. It says clearly, the Supreme Court shall make and promulgate rules governing the administration of all courts. And I suspect the administration means um, the administrative staff because they are the ones that administer it. The judges make the, the uh, judicial decisions, but the other people administer the courts. So it would have to be a conversation with the judiciary. Absolutely, but I think it's a worthy conversation. Yeah. And, and there are, I, I've had these kinds of conversations this, I don't have it in front of me now, but there are lots of laws and statutes um, adopted by the General Assembly telling the judiciary how to do certain things. So it's, they're not sacrosanct by any means. Oh, no. Exactly. I, just, I, I, I don't think it's a matter of should they be, but I really think they know that their branch better than we do to make sure it meets the needs of what a conflict of interest looks like. In, in that branch. I, I think it's different for a, the judicial branch than state employees. Really? Uh, how, how do you think they're different? How do you think that they're different as just admin, as administrators? How are they not tempted by the same things the executive branch or the legislative branches? Well, they just have really different administrators than we do. They have they, People are handling different information. I just think they would know better than we would about their own branch of government. Uh, well, we're making a decision about two branches of government. I, I, I don't see that we should be excluding the judiciary, and I think they do the same straightforward work. I mean, they just manage different kinds of stuff, but they're all they're doing is administering and managing. It's not like they're doing something sacred. No, I'm not saying they're less sacred. I mean, they're working with police and you know, a lot of other sensitive information, I feel like it's a different branch of government that should be able to determine their own code of ethics and not, we, we don't know. I, I'm just trying to humble us a little bit. It's just not our job. Well, I think we'll definitely have the conversation with them and see, because they do have their um, judicial rules 
And um, yes. so I think it's important that we hear from them. We certainly can't make a decision without hearing from them. Yeah. Right. And I suppose if we're hearing from another branch of government, we should hear from the secretary of the agency of administration. I am sure that when we get to actually um, addressing the details of this bill, we will hear from almost everybody who has something to say. True. I'd be shocked if it was otherwise. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. Larry, I heard you say something about custodial staff and I yeah. just wondered sort of what that looks like, what Oh, I, you know, all I know, I, I don't know, for, you know, in detail how they handle custodial staff. That was an example, but they hire people, they hire clerks, they hire assistant clerks, they hire people to work in their buildings. And I don't know what overlap there may or may not be with BGS. There may be, there may not be. Um, but they certainly, you know, they have budgets and they award contracts and they make decisions and they hire people. And that kind of work is no different from what goes on in any other branch of government. Um, and the temptations that an individual might have to put their personal interest ahead of, of their governmental interests are the same. Um, and, and that was my point that I don't really see that it would be any, any different. Um, you know, there's certainly ample uh, history of the legislature telling the judiciary um, how to do certain things, you know, like you permit them to have furlough days. You tell them how to administer uh, ticket revenues. Um, you know, you're the ones who create the superior court divisions and subdivisions, you know. So there's a lot of, you know, you set venue for courts, you know. They're, Except their budget. Yeah. I guess I'm yeah. asking a different question, which is, wh when have you received a complaint about a custodial staff person? Oh, I've never received a complaint about okay. a custodial staff. I just pulled that out of the air. Okay. Um, and, and if that clouded the issue, then I'm happy to take well, it I asked, back. I mean, <laughs> when I was on general housing and military affairs, we worked a lot on making sure custodial staff weren't over-scrutinized, credit checks, et cetera. I mean, a lot of people tend to blame custodial staff if they believe there's some kind of unethical behavior happening. They tend to put a lot of, just like we saw with the polygraph tests, et cetera. I feel like when we're trying to solve bigger problems, we put our, we put a lot of screws on the lowest paid workers. So I was just really curious what you meant by that. No, no. And, and that was probably um, not the best I could have come up with, but I think, you know, the idea is if I'm hiring somebody and I don't know who hires custodial staff over there. Um, if they do it or if they use BGS, maybe maybe it's a non-issue, but they do hire people. And if it's a matter of, do I hire my son's boy girlfriend or somebody else, that's an ethical issue. And that's no different there than it would be anywhere else in state government. So I, I think that there are two things that I just wanna say about that. One, in that same section that I read from the constitution, it also says, any rule adopted by the Supreme Court may be revised by the General Assembly. Yes. So <laughs> we do have some authority there. We're not completely distinct uh, branches of government. But the uh, And the other complicating issue here is that some of the um, court people are county employees as opposed to state employees. So that gets a little complicated here about who, who would, if, if we included the judiciary um, non judges who would be covered everybody who works for the judiciary or only the people that work for the state for the judiciary so i i just we just need to have more discussion about this yep um where are we committee well, oh, I'm sorry. No, oh no, or Larry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I think we've, you know, we've gone through when when you were at, at your other hearing, um, Senator White. Basically, we're just going through the the main points of the code, the do's and the don'ts, um, which I don't want to characterize what other people said, but I, I I would submit that many of those things are fairly straightforward. And uh, not really, um, I would hope, not a matter of, of much debate. You know, basically everything that's in there 
It is a matter of per putting our duty to the state of Vermont ahead of our personal interests. And that same you know, preferential treatment or using confidential information, um, being fair to people, it all comes down to that really that one basic thing is our duty to the state of Vermont comes first. And if we let our personal interests come first, then we violated one of these provisions. And that's pretty straightforward. Um, the areas of discussion will be, you know, to what extent this or to whom will this apply uh, and to what extent and, um, and how do we work out some of those fine points. But I think, uh, I mean, if, if I had a, a theme, it would be that uh, we should, this is me, the advocate now, try and keep it as simple as possible um, to get something that people would understand and that we can educate on and, and raise awareness about our duty as state um, employees, state officials, um, because I think the public needs to hear this. I mean, there's so much cynicism these days, oh. especially after the last couple of years. Um, anything that we can do to let the public, to assure the public that we're really on their side and not in it for ourselves uh, would serve us all well and make our jobs much easier. And I've said before, I think some people worry that an ethics code is, is a, a trap for the unwary. And I, I don't see it that way. I don't think it has to be that way. I think if anything, it protects us. If the public knows what is expected of us, and we're open and transparent about what we're doing, people will trust us more. So I see it as more of a shield for us in state government um, than a sword to be used against us. And I think it would help all of us um, to have something that applies to us and that the public can have some confidence in. And that's why you know, I think it should be as inclusive as possible um, and and should be clear that it applies to everybody um, where where it can um, and with no exceptions. So, so for me, clearly we won't get this passed this year. We know that, but we it would be great if we come back in January and we're really ready to. Um, we'll we'll take this up the first week we come back, and and uh, get judiciary in here and whoever else we need to, all the advocacy groups and anybody who wants to testify. What would be helpful to me is um, to see what it would look like. If I go to the state of Vermont website, once, once this is passed and adopted, I go to the state of Vermont website and I look for the state code of ethics. I don't want to see this because this is so garbled. And I mean, just the, the it's, it's, drafting it's, construct, I, I would like to see what it says and how it's laid out. And I, I don't know, but for me, that would be very, very helpful so that I could see it without all the kind of- like It's sort of distilled in bullet points. Of well, what how, however, However it would be presented, I don't know if it's bullet points or little paragraphs or sentences or what, but how it would look to the public who wants to look at the state code of ethics. That would, I don't know about anybody else, but that would really help me to understand what it is we're doing here. And then all this other stuff is statutory construct and backup and uh, explanations and stuff. Right. I've been thinking the same thing, exactly. Because I've been looking at this and wondering, like, if I think somebody broke the law or broke the ethics code, I'm going to go look at a piece of legislation. I, I, want, to, I want to look at a list of things that do's and don'ts. Right, yeah. exactly. Make it simple. And if you look at what we sent you in November, that's the format that you want, I think. Right. I, did, I don't think I even have it anymore, but I would like to that's see it posted. again. It's posted on our website. Okay. Right. On it's today. on our website. Under if you Larry's name. It. Yeah, it's under Larry's name for today. OK, although having having said that, I also actually think that this is this piece of legislation is a lot simpler than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad to see that it's it's it is fairly. 
confined. I mean, I, I think that the, the work on the in terms of the, the bill itself is not as complicated as I was afraid it might be. Yeah. Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Larry, I just want to recognize your efforts and TJ's and uh, whoever else worked on this because I, I can clearly see a lot of work went into this. And uh, it's unfortunate for many reasons that we didn't get to this earlier in this session, but we will get to it next year for sure. But the chair, I think, has, has raised a good point and, and the other senators have chimed in as well. If I'm just an average Vermonter and I have a feeling that there's something not right with a particular situation, if we can manage to write it in plain English so that somebody goes to the Vermont State of Vermont website and is able to distill for themselves exactly what this covers, and I, I just think it would be a lot more important than constantly referring to six VSA chapter blah, 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 because most people that I know don't have any idea what those things even mean, but they sure as heck know if something is not right with, you know, a particular situation. So thank you for your work. But um, I do think um, Senator White's raised a, a very good point that if we could get it, and I don't know how to wordsmith it any better than, than you do, um, but put it in plain English so that if, when people see it, they know what this covers. Right. Well, I can send you again another copy of what we submitted last November, which is yeah. plain English. The only trouble I have with the legislative uh, draft, H384, is it is all chopped up to fit into the existing statute. Yeah, well, that's as, the way we have to do it. Yeah, I know. And as you can tell, going through it today, it's it's just hard to follow that way. I agree 100%. So I don't see it under today's, under yeah. your name. It's 98 pages long. And it's no. a, it says under Larry Novins. No, no, that's... I thought oh, that's... I, referring to well um said when I, he said this in november i did print it's okay it's not on today's it, documents it's under today's documents under larry novens november it says november 11th 2020 not under today's um, yeah. can i share my screen yeah it's under today's oh all of the all i see under today's is ethic commission submitted Proposal yeah. Code of Ethics and Attachments. That's it. That's, that's it. That's, that's his November 11th document that he sent us in November. And where is the where is the Code of Ethics that someone would look at? Uh, it, well, the bill is under Ameren's name. No, no, no. That's not what I meant. I I printed out that whole 98 page thing. Yeah. But what I don't see anywhere there, and Larry, maybe you can show me what page it's on. Yeah. is something that um, the, the average Vermonter could look at and could say, this is the code of ethics. If, yeah, let me share my screen. May All right, I? yep. Oh, I can't, I'm just saying. Gail, Gail will have to give you um, co something. Okay. Co I'll try it now. There we so go. It's, it, it's eight pages. Yeah, it's eight pages. Yeah. Really, we uh, the what you we have posted is ninety eight pages. Right, but there's eight pages of it that are the guts no, but of. this what, isn't. This, this doesn't. This it's not as plain English as you would like it to be. I agree with that. This but isn't what, what I want to see. This isn't what I want to yeah, see. What, yeah, you want to see something distilled and easy to read and clear. No, I want to see. I want to see what the public would see. I don't think the public cares that more than forty states have codes of ethics. Uh, and this doesn't tell me, they don't care about the findings and the legislative intent. They don't care about any of that. What right. they want to see is a nice um, one page list of the things, the do's and don'ts, as Senator Collimore said. That's what they, that's what they want to see. And that's what I'd like to see is because I read all of that, but it didn't, but no public person is going to read that. Does that make any sense? Yes, it makes sense. It what's, me. what's in here is a distillation of the, the bill, which I think was a good start towards plain English. But you're saying we got to go more into plain English. 
Well, <laughs> what I would like to see is um, the Boy Scouts, well, that's a bad example now. The Girl Scouts yeah. have a code of ethics. It is five things. You, you should do this, you shouldn't do this. The, um, uh, I don't know, that, that's all I think people want have, when Senator Colmore and Senator Polina both said is, people need to be able to go there and see, this is what they can do, this is what they can't do. Just in 10 words or less for every, everything. They can't accept a gift over $20. I, I mean, I, I don't know what they can't, um, they can't use their position for personal gain. Those are the kinds of things, the, all the backup behind that is, is, is important, but that's what they need to see. Mm -hmm. right. Does that I'm make sure be happy to, to give sure. you a one, one and a half page summary in plain English. Not a summary. I don't, I don't want a summary. Okay, then synopsis? I want a list. I want a list of things that we can, that state employees can do and can't do. So just to be fair, I've, I've looked at like three or four other states code of ethics right now. They're, they're not very easy to read. I, I don't know. I haven't found a model yet. I think like corporations have pretty simple codes of ethics, whether or not we agree with them following it, but it's these other states have huge, long, complicated lists that are kind of, I, I think they're more designed for lawyers and policymakers than for the public. It's just, yeah. it's, I just don't see a model like what you're talking about in other states, just from a cursory glance. Right. Now, maybe, maybe I'm asking for something that's impossible to do, but I, I just good. don't see, I mean, I, I was thinking of when you said corporations have it, and this isn't a code of ethics necessarily, but you know, when we tend to have mission statements that are just outrageously mom and pop and don't really say anything anyway, and vision statements and stuff like that, you know what, um, I think it's, um, I, I think it was Helena Rubinstein, isn't that a, 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 a makeup company, right? Right. And I think it was them that their motto was, we manufacture chemicals, we sell hope. Mm. <laughs> I, I mean. It's great, but how do you enforce that? Yeah. <laughs> there is a 14 item code of ethics for executive branch employees of the US government. That's much easier to read. I'm happy to circulate that to the okay. committee. That's yeah, the something like that with just. Yeah. And I think FAQs would be helpful when we're when we're ready to roll this out. It would be great to have a whole list of frequently asked questions. Too. Right, right. For for us and to be able to respond to people. But I really want to see what what the public is going to see when they go to the state of Vermont Code of Ethics, well, so that it's very clear we cannot use our positions for personal gain. We right. cannot accept gifts over a certain amount. We cannot, that's what I'd like to see. But we need to maybe pass a code of ethics before we do that. Well, we have, we have the draft here. I, oh, I agree, it would be. It I'd would like be to great. see what, if we pass this draft as it is, what would we see? It's not dissimilar from the code of ethics that the commission came up with a year and a half ago. Well, use that as a format then. Mm, but it's different enough that it's going to cause. I mean, problems. use it as a format, but not the not the, the trouble, content. The trouble is, it, we're talking about a law, and th th the trouble with laws is there are people looking for loopholes all the time. So we were very, we tried to be as careful as we could to answer a lot of the questions and a lot of the what ifs with this language. And I, I, maybe this is my legal training. I don't know how to keep it simple and easily understood without depriving it of its, of its meaning or eventual enforceability. Well, you could always- well, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong here, but you'll always, we'll always have the law. Whatever we pass, the law will always be there. The mm -hmm. statutes will be there. 
the people who administer or who determine the code of, code of ethics or who make decisions will know what the backup is, but the public doesn't need all that information. They're, they're the ones that are going to be looking for um, what is it, what is Senator White doing that is unethical? I'm going to try and find her something that she's doing that's unethical. So they go to that list and they say, aha, somebody took her to dinner the other night and I know it was over $20. Um, I guess maybe I'm asking for something different than, I, I don't want to make the law. So it, it, just bullet points. No, it, but, the public doesn't read the law. I think what I sent that's 14 items from the federal government for state, I mean, for US employees is it tracks a lot with everything we've been talking about. It just makes it. And in fact, I think the public, in addition to the people who are being governed by this, they have a right to yeah. understand it and play English as well. And so I think it's a pretty good model that in my view so far doesn't conflict with what we've talked about and may add some value to the conversation but oh, you're right did you send it to larry i don't think you did he, oh, she no. e emailed it to all of us i know but i'll forward it to larry okay yeah the spacing got weird i apologize i don't know it's like copy but you can look at it in the website link itself yeah i you know it came through perfect in your email oh, okay yeah. I don't have TJ's email, but I sent it to Larry. Thank you. Okay. So committee, I hate I hate to beat a dead horse on that one, but I, I just feel it's really important to have oh, yeah. those simple, simple bullet points that people can understand. Yeah. Let's say you, you know, let's say there was like an AmeriCorps who was new to state government and you're like this is you know this is the code of ethics we follow you're not going to ask them to read the law you're going to ask them to understand you know hey you're here for 6 months you should know the ways we try to maintain and that's easier to adopt in a local municipality or where i think it's easier to have as a guide okay so i think that anything that's simple you can always have an asterisk and say See title blah blah and to, for the whole law at the bottom. Well, anybody anybody in their right mind is going to know that this is not the backup information. That there's there's information behind this that has to be followed, and that um, I uh, anyway. Right. In, in fact, we're very clear when people deserve to know their rights and responsibilities in, in plain English, because it's only fair to, yeah. to your ability to enforce them. Okay, so thank you. So Larry, you. we will um, probably not see you until January. And again, we apologize for putting you off so much, but I think this has been a good discussion. I'm sorry I missed part of it, um, but I think it puts us in a good place to land in January. And we can all spend a lot of time over the summer and fall thinking about this and contemplating it and um, well, come back in January ready to rock and roll. Senator Clarkson. So Larry, is there anything we can do as a committee or we could do as a joint committee with the House to advance the ball at all during the, our off session that, that would be useful? Like, I don't know, public hearing? On, I mean, it, it, or, or should we just not, we'll just wait and pick it all up in January. It's, I don't know. I mean, that's that's your bailiwick. I, I think you need to hear from more people um, and how you choose to do that. I mean, you know yeah. best how to do that. I. I can't advise you. Well, we can have a public hearing in the in January. My my preference is not to have a public hearing because in public hearings you have people get their two minutes or their three minutes and there's no discussion and it just goes bam 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 and there's I would prefer to have to take as many days as we need in the committee and hear from anybody who has something they would like to say. Just because I think public hearings often 
they don't allow the committee to ask questions and to say, well, what do you mean by this? And I think they're very unsatisfactory for both people who um, testify and for the committee members. Senator Colomar. Thank you, Madam Chair. I agree. Um, I think the normal legislative process, which involves committee work, will definitely attract those folks who have a passion for this, and they will be able to at least speak to the provisions that Larry has, has put together. And I think we'd be much further ahead. It's almost like starting from, from all over again, if we have a public hearing, many of the public has already responded to Larry. And um, I think we have the benefit of uh, some pretty hard work on that side. So yeah, I think for sure, uh, the, the regular committee work will, to me, make the most sense. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, okay. Thank you. Larry. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank lot. you, TJ. Thanks, thank TJ. You. Thank you. This was great. Thank and you. a lot of work. Uh, we know that you put a we lot of work into this, and we appreciate it. Well, thank you all. All right. Well so, done. Let's jump to uh, S15, Could the elections take, bill. What? Can we take a five-minute exercise break? Okay. Chris, is that okay with you?